Chapter 40 From the Tree of Life Sixth of August, 1840, from 3.45 to 5.30 p.m. In the Freiburger Forest, near St. Leonard, Graz. The forest contains pines, spruces and firs. Jacob Lorber speaks, actually the Lord through him. KGL Andrew H. and Ants H. Wright Here in this forest, where you are just now, and in whose primordial depth you intend to penetrate, there is a forest for the tenth time, and it is always occupied by the same kind of trees that are in harmony with the nature of the ground since it would not be easy for another kind of tree to exist here. Because, you see, each tree stands on its own spot and spreads a large number of large roots and especially small, so-called hair roots, into the loose soil on which it stands. But every such tree is given a vegetative soul, or, as you can more easily understand, Every tree has a silent spirit within it. This spirit has a very simple intelligence. By means of this property which I have given him, he recognises in the earth the food parts which suit him, creates according to my will at the roots, since he lives exquisitely, many thousands of arms, with which he picks up and drives the juices under the loose earth and leads them through the tubes and channels which he has designed up to the highest summit and to all branches of the tree. However, the juices, as he recognises them to be suitable for his constitution under the earth, he first separates them into the different parts in the branches the coarser ones are deposited in the trunk, and even the more impure ones are driven over the sphere of the trunk and form the bark, or as it were, the skin or the clothing of the tree. The finer juices are used to form the branches. For see, wherever a branch has grown from the trunk of a tree, at this very spot you will see this branch penetrating almost to the centre of the trunk, in a much finer and more compact mass. That this happens in this way is due to the simple intelligence of the tree spirit, who makes the fibres and tubes of the branch wood ten times finer than those of the main trunk. Only much finer sap can be passed through these finer organs which are much more substantial. If you now look at the branches, you will see a far greater number of twigs sticking out from the branches themselves. The same thing happens from the branches into the twigs as from the trunk into the branches. And so the sap in the twigs is again more than ten times finer and more substantial and thus also stronger, than from the trunk into the branches. Of the branches, a lot of the smallest tubes are left open in good order in many thousands of places. Through these tubes a juice is also expelled in tenfold fineness, or as you can more easily understand it, in tenfold, according to your learned expression, chemical refinement. From this juice, the leaves or needles are formed by the spirit according to its simple intelligence, which according to my order are suitable for such a particular tree. And when such a leaf or needle has reached orderly perfection, then the channels and organs leading from the branches into it 
are gradually blocked or closed, so that out of a thousand tubes leading to it, only a single middle one is left open, through which the leaf receives its nourishment. Finally, however, even this channel is closed, and since the leaf then no longer receives any nourishment, it falls withered and dead from the tree. At the outermost tips of the twigs, however, there are a million of the very finest organs, the diameter of a sewing needle, which are endowed with an animal life. When the juices arrive there, a formal battle or war takes place there, because the spirit, in its unfairness, wants to gain freedom from its captivity in the tree, and let the whole material essence of the tree down, so to speak. In such an undertaking alone, these organs constrict in order to block the passage. As he thereby becomes aware of his imprisonment in his simple intelligence, he gradually abandons his fruitless attempts and takes refuge in humble humility, whereby his whole being then begins to transform into love. Just as this happens, so these very cramped organs are softened and expanded by his warmth of love and he himself becomes ethereal and truly alive through his love. When this has happened, then in his heightened intelligence, he remembers the corresponding good of love, and acts as a love effect on the outermost branches of these organs, as the fruit of the tree. And after he has now set himself as such for your eyes, in a hardly noticeable size, that I let breathe out of my mercy through the warmth of grace and the light of the sun, an extraordinarily small spark. He then seizes this spark eagerly on the many hundreds of offshoots and extensions and carefully encloses it in a small sleeve. When, as it were, this natural spiritual marriage has taken place, then immediately the blossom, as the organ of procreation, and finally also the fruit, are made according to the tree, and brought to maturity by the ever more and more spreading warmth of the spark. It often happens that due to careless inertia of the spirit, some of the offshoots of such trees are overlooked. Then after a short time, this spark escapes back to its origin. Then the vessels of the twig constrict immediately and no longer give any food to such a fruit set. Such a fruit will soon fall from the tree withered and dead. But in the fruit which has become perfect, this spark of life is well and carefully preserved in a fine pod in the middle of the seed. And since it is a spark of life from my love and mercy, it contains, similar to its origin, which am I myself, infinite numbers of its kind in itself. From such a seed, even in a thousand years, more than many millions of the same trees can develop and so on to infinity. For I am eternal and infinite in the smallest as well as in the greatest, and infinite myself. Now see, there you now have a tree, or as many as you like, in its entire existence. Now I still have to show you the origin as well as the end of it. The creation of such a tree is in itself very simple. Namely, such a seed falls or is placed in the earth. As it is now in the earth, it calls a spirit, nature spirit, 
banished into matter, to and within itself. This gives such a spirit the first life impulse and the simplest intelligence of its being. Since he is fundamentally evil, he immediately wants to capture that little spark of life, breathed in from the love of God's mercy, murderously. But this little spark of life always escapes his pursuit. Therefore, this spirit always seeks out parts similar to it, or spirits similar to it, in the earth and enlarges and multiplies itself visibly, as you can convince yourself by a tree that has grown up. Because this growing up of the tree happens exactly through the murderous pursuit of this released spirit, or if you like, of a whole legion of such spirits. The little spark of life escapes ever higher and higher from the area of such malicious pursuit. In their fury, many millions and millions of such spirits, attracted by the little spark of life, harden again into silent, dead matter, which you can see on the wood and bark of a tree. Through such pursuits, which often continue for many years, such spirits are finally humiliated again, and then reach the appropriate useful freedom and finally become one with the spark of life. Such a spirit, which in this way has lovingly united itself with the spark of life at the beginning, will, after the full ripening of the fruit, be ethereally free and led into a higher, more intelligent being, according to my eternal order. And so on until finally, to you humans. If such a tree, as a material institution of salvation, has redeemed a sufficient number of natural spirits, and these redeemed spirits have lovingly united in their ethereal freedom from the most diverse trees and plants, so that they represent a spirit in higher intelligence, then such spirits are then transferred into the animal world and brought there to the second stage. If all the spirits of the animal world again lovingly unite to form one spirit, then such a spirit is capable of ascending to the higher stage and being placed in man as a simple spirit, as a soul, from where After maturity, it can emerge independently and freely acting to contemplate its eternally loving primordial source. Such a spirit will never have anything to do with matter. Only for spirits that have become evil again in man, where no means of love can be used in a well understood way, will a similar long and difficult path be taken again. A tree stem that is used up in such a way, that is, a tree stem that has given up its spiritual life elements to higher levels of existence in the manner described, then dies again, dries up and rots, or, even better, it is cut down and burned. Now, see, this is the secret of the plants, shrubs and trees from their emergence to their end. However, since I noticed at the beginning that here already for the tenth time a forest stands, I want to tell you briefly something else. See, just as often this ground, dampening the hellfire of satanic wickedness, has been under the floods for over a hundred years. Therefore, if you would dig only a few fathoms deep in some places, you would soon get to single charred trees from the past, where you would find insects from this time well preserved in the still existing resin in some places. And you would find this in layers of 10, 20, 50, 100, 
five hundred, a thousand, and even more fathoms deep. Look what I am doing for the sake of one haughty angel, Lucifer. I tell you, no earth, nor sun, nor any other material thing would ever have been created if this one would have remained humble. Alone out of love, I, eternal love, filled infinity with suns and worlds, so that I could still save even the smallest part of this fallen one. Therefore, you also consider all that I have done, still do, and will do for you forever. Amen. I, the eternal love. Amen.